Well, good morning, First Baptist family. It is again my privilege uh, to welcome you to our Tuesday morning uh, men's Bible study. If you'll forgive me real quickly, I'm going to erase something from my screen. I know you don't see it, but I do. Uh, that is just one of the byproducts of being absolutely live here from the friendly confines of my office at First Baptist Church of Opelika. Now, a few weeks ago, when we started broadcasting from my office on Facebook Live, uh, we were at the beginning of a global pandemic. I think most of us thought this would be maybe a couple or a few weeks in length. We didn't quite know. But it appears now that a few weeks is probably going to turn into a few months. I'm not trying to be a negative Nelly. I'm not trying to be a naysayer. I'm just looking at the reality of how we're seeing uh, those who are in, um, shall we say, positions of leadership, those who are in the World Health Organization, those of others who are, are giving wisdom and advice on how to navigate um, what I personally believe is a scene very similar uh, to the year 1918, where the world walked through what we commonly refer to as the Spanish flu. Um, unfortunately, there was an incredible amount of loss of life in those days, and we're experiencing loss of life in our days. And we're just perfectly walking uh, that our journey through history will not uh, be as dramatic and drastic as theirs was. So, you know, one of the things I say all the time in our Bible studies is the thing we don't learn from history is to learn from history. And when you go back a little over 100 years ago and you see how the world responded, not only coming out of World War I, but walking through uh, what we commonly refer to as the Spanish flu, there are many newspaper ads and such that you see out there that uh, the schools closed and, and, yes, the churches even closed. Uh, why? Because they were concerned for the health of themselves and their neighbors, and it was a gesture of kindness and love that they did not want to purposefully or even accidentally endanger somebody else's life by gathering in groups. And so we find ourselves in the same position today. But here's the blessing of today. We have technology. Uh, you're sitting in your living room, driving in your car, maybe you're already at the office. You know, one of the privileges of, of doing it the way that we're doing it is we used to gather several dozen men in a local eating establish, establishment, and uh, we'd have Bible study. And now we're gathering with several hundred of us literally all over the world. And so even in the midst of a situation that is not one of which any of us would have desired, uh, the Lord has allowed us to make the best of it. And that's really kind of our theme today from the book of First Thessalonians. For those of you who may be brand new to us and uh, you've not had the privilege of walking through uh, this Bible study, we're walking through the book of First Thessalonians. We started this uh, a little over a month ago with the design and the purpose of walking through the letters that the Lord gave us through the Apostle Paul in chronological order, um, almost kind of a, a personal reset button. Let's go back to what did the early church look like 20, 30 years after the resurrection? What did the early church look like before its first major wave of state-sponsored persecution? What did we look like in our infancy? And, and not necessarily to go back to the exact, uh, shall we say, outward appearance thereof, but the mentality, the mindset. What were they struggling with? What were they succeeding at? What were the challenges that God brought them? And kind of walking through uh, the letters the Apostle Paul gave us in chronological order. Interesting is, um, as I've said almost every time I've been broadcasting lately, it doesn't matter what passage of scripture you find yourself in. It speaks to the day, the situation, and even the struggles uh, that you or I or others may be walking through. And such we find ourselves today. Because really, if you look at what we know as the book of 1 Thessalonians, they uh, they had a, shall I say, a crossroads that presented uh, themselves that as they walk through difficulties, struggles, doubts, questions. In fact, when we get to chapter four, they are truly questioning the fact that is there really this everlasting eternal life that Jesus Christ promised and that Paul taught us because, you know, we were told that we would never die and there are people that we're doing funerals for. And so they begin to struggle uh, with the issues, the great questions of life, issues and struggles and questions that you have and I have even 2,000 years later. And so when you get to the end of chapter four, it says comfort one another with these words. And that is my hope and desire today, that no matter where you find yourself, already at the office, driving down the road, maybe in the living room, in the kitchen of your home, uh, wherever you find yourself, I want you to find comfort in the word of God today because almost all other communication we're receiving is not very comfortable. And today we come to the end of chapter two of First Thessalonians, verses 14 through 20. And what we're going to see is that they were at a crossroads. We are at a crossroads of life. If you've ever been at a crossroads or an intersection, uh, you understand and realize that there are you know, multiple ways in which you could continue your journey. And kind of the theme that I want to lay out today 
is they had the opportunity, we had the opportunity to look at their life, their circumstances, their situations, the decisions that uh, they were needing and having to make. And they could either see it as an obstacle or an opportunity. Now, I'm going to read the passage today, and then we're going to kind of dive in uh, to that, shall we say, crossroads of life. It says, For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, uh, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their prophets. They persecuted us, and they pleased not God. They are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavor the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. But what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Now, if you've been with our study uh, the last couple of weeks, hopefully you're familiar with this, but just a little recap here uh, that these early believers in what we know as the area of Thessalonica, uh, the Apostle Paul was encouraging them that they had turned uh, from their idols, uh, from the wrath was to come to believing in Jesus Christ. And he was basically encouraging them that as he followed Christ, that they were to follow him. He was setting an example uh, for them. And one of the things that he says in the early part of chapter 2, is how he set that example, how he lived his life, not just as an instructor in righteousness, not just as one to model it for them, but whether they were following or not, this is how he was going to live his life anyway. And the two illustrations that we spoke of last week is that he did so as a nurse and as a father. How appropriate for today. Uh, One, as a nurse who is bringing health, who is guiding, who's healing wounds, uh, who is there in sometimes our our darkest moments. And as a father, one who has an intimate setting and environment and is to guide on a daily basis. And you get to the end of chapter two, he takes kind of that concept of guiding, of nursing, of fathering them as believers. And he shares with them kind of the harsh reality of what it's like to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Beginning in verse verse 14, he speaks about the difficulties that they will walk in, the the sufferings, the what we would call today maybe the the persecutions. In fact, when we get into chapter 3, he's going to speak even more intensely about and more specifically about what that means. But then he ends with encouraging them to, to hang in there, and there's laid up this crown of rejoicing. And so today, I want to look at our lives. I want to look at, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as we as we walk this journey, and by the way, we're walking a journey today that none of us are really intimately familiar with or can call anybody up or email somebody and say, hey, what did you do in your day? Because I think historically, at least in the modern era, the only way we can compare today is back 1918. And very few of any people on planet Earth were alive then and are cognizant of, of sharing. And if they were, they would have been little children. But there are those who have heard from their parents and their grandparents and what that would have been like. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, allow me again to remind us, it doesn't matter if it's a global pandemic or a time of prosperity. The word of God is true in every situation and in all circumstances. And we really have a decision to make. Will we allow our faith to take us through our circumstances or our circumstances to determine our faith. And so two opportunities are presented. Is it going to be an obstacle or is it going to be an opportunity? And before we dig in the details of this passage, let me just begin there. We're walking through these days and we really have a choice as believers. Is this going to be an obstacle or is this going to be an opportunity? Is a global pandemic that Uh, encourages and and in some cases enforces social distancing. And as believers, we haven't met with our Sunday school classes in person for almost a month. We haven't gathered in large groups. We have not heard each other sing the truths of our faith for almost a month. You know, this is unprecedented, at least in all of our lives. Is this going to be an obstacle or is this going to be an opportunity? A question that I think you probably have an idea of where I'm going to go with it, but nonetheless, I'll leave you somewhat hanging there. So let's look at the obstacles here. What did he say? He said these guys in in Thessalonica, these these young, uh, these new believers, they were facing sufferings and difficulties. And in their case, it was the Gentiles. And he refers back to the, the first believers in Jerusalem that it was the Jewish people and talked about how difficult they were and how uh, unprecedented it was, so to speak. 
And one of the things I want to share with you is the obstacles that you and I are going to find in our own life as believers. There's really two aspects that are going to happen. Number one, they're going to be very subtle. And number two, they're going to be very slanderous. I mean, those are two just generalities there. You say, what do you mean by subtle? Have you noticed that, at least, at least in my own personal walk with the Lord, that the obstacles come from the, I shall we say, least expected sources? You know, oftentimes the people who you thought would be your biggest advocates, the people who you thought were your biggest fans, the people who you thought, can I use a phrase, hedge back, you find out in the end they were stabbing you in the back. And that's really what he's addressing there. These sufferings that are coming of their fellow countrymen, uh, they, they weren't expecting this. They thought everybody was going to get on board. Doesn't everybody believe in this Jesus? Doesn't everybody want the church of Jesus Christ uh, to be everything it can be? And they were facing opposition, much like the early believers in Jerusalem experienced the same thing. You know, I think sometimes we forget that those 120 believers plus the women that were gathered in the upper room of Acts chapter 2, even though they were huddled and they were nervous and they were concerned, I think we often think, well, yeah, they were concerned because, you know, Rome was not appreciative and, and here Jesus of Nazareth, their Messiah, our Messiah had been crucified and there was this kind of this vibe in the community uh, that it was somewhat treacherous to be a believer. Well, I think that's true. But I think also we forget that the people who were not in the room with them that should have been were their own family members, their own coworkers, their own teammates. And people who they thought surely they would encourage me, surely uh, they would be in favor of this, but they were not. And and sometimes it's subtle. And, and what I mean by that, like in the book of Jude, verse three and four, you know, and I know we studied that as a men's Bible study uh, in 2019. And, and you walk through those verses where it says that he wanted to come and encourage them, but he had to kind of challenge them because there were certain men who had crept in unawares. And they were wreaking havoc, even denying the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, we expect opposition from the outside. We typically don't expect it from the inside. And oftentimes, not all the times, but oftentimes, when we as believers in Jesus Christ, when we are having opposition in our life or people who are trying to, as I like to say, throw cold water on the hot flame of our faith, sometimes it comes from the inside. You know, let me give you some encouragement this morning. If there's a believer in Jesus Christ who, shall we say, is one of those cold water believers, and what I mean by that is they're always throwing the cold water on you or they're always a negative toward your fervor or your desire or your ambition for the Word of God and, and the things of God, one of the things that I've noticed over the years, and I've had one of the privileges, I know I'm not physically as, as aged as, as some of you may be on the other side of this camera, but I've been walking with the Lord now almost 40 years, and I haven't seen everything, but I've seen a lot. When you are excited about or you are passionate about your walk with Jesus Christ and those who claim to be believers and those that are believers are, shall we say, not as uh, excited as you are and oftentimes bring negativity and opposition in your life, one of the things I've learned is the reason they do that is because deep down inside they're really envious that you're walking with the Lord as they know they should be and you're challenging them, and you're bringing conviction from the Holy Spirit in their life. And what do we typically do? If we can't, quote, beat somebody, we take them out. And unfortunately, that seeps into the body of Christ as well. And so this opposition they're facing from the Gentiles, these are individuals that could have been and should have been fellow believers. They would have been those who were closest to them. Uh, they were people that they, uh, shall we say, walked life together with. But it was subtle, and uh, it came among their own. And it was slanderous. You know, when we speak of slander, often we think of words that are being said. Of course, obviously, those words can produce ultimately into actions. But the, the things that were done unto them that were negative, the suffering they experienced, were slanderous. Now, I'm going to uh, address something that I alluded to or actually spoke of on Sunday night as well. By the way, those of you who are faithful watchers and attenders here at First Baptist Opal, I could at least in this online environment, We'll notice that I'm doing everything I can to kind of, uh, shall we say, tie things together uh, as far as all of our services are concerned. Little adjustment there. Um, you know, we talked about Sunday night uh, back in Second Chronicles chapter 7, this, this incredible prayer of God healing um, our land if we would humble ourselves, seek God and pray, uh, etc. And I addressed something in passing that many of you have uh, brought forward to me individually. And I really want to dig down deep into it a little bit this morning. There was an editorial 
in the New York Times this past weekend that essentially is blaming the chaos and, shall we say, the dramatic uh, escalation of what you and I know as this global pandemic in the United States, blamed it on the evangelical Christian community. Now, you can go and look it up for yourself. Now, there are situations, there are personalities, there are things that are addressed in that article that are rightfully due. There are believers, there are churches, there are pastors and preachers out there who, shall we say, are acting recklessly. They're going contrary to the advice the health officials are giving. Uh, They're going against, shall we say, the accepted new uh, behaviors of their community and such. But putting those aside, the general theme was that you and I as Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, you know, agents of mercy and grace, that we're again the problem. You say, what do you mean again the problem? Well, I've been stating this for years. It just amazes me that when you look at, at the history of Christianity, and don't get me wrong, we've we've had our negative moments. We've had our, our bad spells, so to speak. But as a general rule of thumb, we are what Jesus called us. We are salt. We are light. I mean, you think about how many universities in this country were started as seminaries or, or places of higher learning with a biblical foundation. How many hospitals were started with a denominational name uh, in the, in their name, the Baptist Hospital, the Methodist Hospital, the whatever it may be, hospital. You think about even right now in New York City that's had one of the, the greatest escalations of this pandemic. Who is putting up a tent in the middle of Central Park? Samaritan's Purse. The same people who were housed in our basement during a tornado outbreak a, a little over a year ago. People and agents of faith and mercy and grace And yet we set up tents to help the sick. We have hospitals to help the sick. We have schools to teach those who would otherwise not have learning. And somehow, again, we're the enemy. Now, this should not come as a surprise to us. In John chapter 16, Jesus warned us of this. And here in the book of 1 Thessalonians, to these early Christians, he's basically saying, guys, if you're experiencing this in Thessalonica, don't worry. We experienced it back in Jerusalem as well, back in the early days of the faith. One of the things that's going to be a natural response by the lost world to the hope and joy that we bring in the name of Jesus Christ is going to be opposition. It's going to be subtle. Usually it comes from those who you least expect. And one of the things I've learned in life is often those who are most excited about what the church is doing are the people you'd be, I guess, least expecting to be exciting. And those who are the most negative are the ones that you thought would be most supportive. And then it was slanderous. But at the end of the day, At the end of the day, he says, Satan hindered us. That's what he says in verse 18, that Satan hindered them. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because I want to get to the opportunity because that's kind of the exciting part of this. But there are obstacles that are out there. There are people, there are things uh, that exist in our lives that can somewhat put barriers up and, and cause us kind of to put on the brakes, not in a good way, but in a bad way. He says, Satan actually hindered us. Now, Hopefully you had access to or you uh, have sought after the outline that we posted online. You know, nowadays we're not printing almost anything off. In fact, everything we're doing is electronic nowadays, and I'm grateful uh, for the technology. But one of the things that I did for verse 18 of this passage is just walk through some of the things, some of the qualities of, of who we know in the Bible as Satan or as the devil and how he utilizes these qualities to subtly slander us, bring opposition uh, to the exercise of the proclamation or the living of our faith. First thing I said is he was discreet. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, it says, do not know that Satan and those uh, who I like to call his minions, but those who are his devils is what the Bible calls them, that they transform themselves into the angel of light. Back to that subtle concept that you think that they're actually advocating. You think that they're endorsing you and supporting you, And he found out later their actual intent was to infiltrate and to turn and to destroy. Very determined. Uh, Our enemy is very determined. He does not desire the church of Jesus Christ, whether we're meeting online or in person. He does not desire us to thrive and to impact a lost and dying world uh, that is around us. That is the last uh, thing that he wants. But yet, what did Jesus tell us in Matthew chapter 16? Uh, When that great proclamation of faith by who we know Um, as uh, the the apostle Peter, what did he tell him? He said that the gates of hell should not prevail. So discreet, determined, distracting. 
You know, in 1 John chapter 2, it says that there's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that these things that are of the world that are so distracting to us. You know, one of the blessings of what we're walking through today is it really allows us an opportunity to, to refocus some things. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I love the fact that all three of my boys enjoy athletics. I love uh, watching ball games. In fact, uh, Tracy and I would tell you there have been anniversaries that we've sat in the stands together. There have been birthdays that we've been uh, at a soccer field or at a football game, whatever it may be. And one of the things that we say to each other when you know we're at a, shall we say, a date on the calendar that's significant to us, and here we are watching one of our boys do some type of athletic event, is we always look at each other and say, would we want to be anywhere else? Well, of course not. We enjoy each other's company. We enjoy uh, watching our boys um, you know, be athletic at some level. But at the same time, I think athletics has become a great distraction uh, to people of faith. I think education at times has become a great distraction. Ambition has become a great distraction. And today where we are social distancing, today where we are sheltered at home, uh, today where you know, we're watching by way of a live stream rather than in person, one of the things that it has allowed us to do is realize that even those things that were good, even those things that were pleasant, can at times be distracting to our faith. See, when we talk about the obstacles, I think sometimes we talk about other people, institutions that are opposing us. Sometimes it's, it's ourselves that these subtle, shall we say, slant, things become slanderous in our life that were distractions that, shall we say, received too much attention, undue attention. And today, when you and I are in the environment that we are, it's allowing us to, as I said earlier in the message, kind of push reset and allow God to reset uh, some things in our life. We understand that our enemy wants to destroy us. Uh, that's his purpose. It says Satan hinder him. He wanted to destroy the message. He wanted to destroy uh, the opportunity for them to impact and influence uh, the world that was around them. But here's the final thing. We could talk about how the enemy works in our life all day long. Many of you have been a part of a lot of those different kinds of Bible studies. But in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, if you don't get anything else in this Bible study on the front half, please get this. It says that our enemy, the devil, wants to wear out the saints. He wants to discourage you. He wants you to get up in the morning and ask yourself, is it really worth it? He wants you to get up in the morning and say, is there any hope? He wants you to get up in the, in, in the morning and say, why even bother? He wants to wear you out. You know, one of the parables of Jesus that I've alluded to uh, quite frequently lately is the parable of the sower. And I don't think it's incidental or ironic that in the interpretation thereof, Jesus said, if you get this parable, you'll understand them all. And in there, we know the famous story that the seed, which is called the word of God, was thrown out on the field, and it was received four different ways. The first one was completely rejected. The second one sprung up quickly, but died in the heat because it had no root. The third one did great for a while, but then it began to uh, lack fruit and not bear any fruit. And then last but not least, one um, produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. You know, one of the things that I have shared with people, and I don't want to say have warned them, is we don't need to be the second seed. You say, what do you mean don't need to be the second seed? Well, in these days of social distancing, these days of, of online worship services, everybody got real excited at first. And wow, I get to be in my living room. I've heard people joke, hey, we're in our pajamas for church. And everybody's real excited. But you know, this newness is going to become real inconvenient real quick. And I hope you're like me. I miss seeing you. I miss singing with you. I miss sharing a cup of coffee with you in the hallway. I miss I miss everything about what we know as the gathering of the body of Christ. But this kind of new normal that we're used to, we've kind of embraced it quickly. I hope that the heat of the days that it doesn't, quote, dry us out because of a lack of a root. And, and, and that's the, shall we say, the discouragement. The enemy wants to discourage you. He wants you, again, like I said, to get up and say, why bother? And I want to encourage you these days. This is why we're going to get to the last half of the Bible study today. My job today, my role today, my hope today is to encourage you. If you're discouraged, keep pressing on. If you're, if you're battling and if you're uh, having difficulty, to keep moving forward. In fact, uh, allow me, uh, before we get to this last part, to use a, a personal illustration. Just last night, and, and this individual may be watching, 
This individual may be a part of our Bible study today. I, I don't know. I had the opportunity to speak to a dear friend of mine, someone who's been a friend of mine for uh, over two decades, who made contact with me last night. And um, this man who has a very similar life to me, he's married with three boys. His three boys are all, two of them are a little bit older than two of mine. One's the same age. Shared with me that he got laid off yesterday. He reached out by way of text and you know, the economic situation kind of hit reality. You know, this is somebody very near and dear to me who is now facing economic hardship in, in a place he never thought he would be. Last night, I had the privilege of making a phone call and just talking with him. And my purpose was to encourage him. But he actually encouraged me. The way that he was walking through and the way that he said uh, that I know that God has a plan for me and my family and that he has a purpose for all this. And the reason I, I bring that that personal story out, even though it's not my own life, it's a dear friend of mine's life, is the excitement that even here we are three, almost four weeks into this mess that we find ourselves in, he loses his job and yet the enemy's not wearing him out. And so we have no idea what news we're going to hear today. I joke that this isn't a day-by-day -day thing. This has actually become an hour-by-hour -hour thing. And, and I, I don't wish upon any of you what happened in his life, but we're reading the news reports and it's going to happen on a frequent basis. Our health is at concern. Our economy is at concern. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, who you got up early this morning, 6.30 Central Time, to do a Bible study. And, and you know, oftentimes the enemy says, is it really worth it? Is it really going to make a difference? You know, last night as I was doing my, my little devotional with the boys that we, we try to do every night, I focused on Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. It says, the Lord has the sun come up on the evil and on the good. He reigns on the just and on the unjust. Right now, there are people who hate everything about God, everything. They're walking through a global pandemic. And there are people that love the Lord Jesus Christ more than life itself and would give up their life for him. And guess what? They're walking through a global pandemic. Our faith does not necessarily change the circumstances that we're walking in. But the circumstances we're walking in, our faith can determine the journey we take. You can take this time in life and it can be a great obstacle to you. You can get discouraged. You can get distracted. You can allow those in your inner circle as well as those on the outer circles of life uh, to speak and to do things that cause you uh, to take a step back and to kind of be like that, uh, shall we say, that second seed to just spring up and kind of wither away. Or more like the third one, to quit bearing fruit. But I want to encourage you to bear some 30, some 60, and some 100. And so if you'll notice that the last part of this passage, the, the verse 19, it says, for what is our hope? <laughs> what is our joy? Isn't that the two things that we need right now? We need some hope. We need some joy. It is the crown of rejoicing. Are you not in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Now, one of the things that you may have heard myself or others uh, who do Bible studies and who preach talk about is a thing in the Bible called the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I know it early in the morning it sounds a little bit ominous, but the judgment seat of Christ is spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Romans chapter 14. Basically, what it says is this, that as a believer in Jesus Christ, we are in the body of Christ. We are seated in the heavenlies. We are secure in him. We know one day when we breathe our last breath, we are forever with him in a place the Bible calls heaven. We got that. But the judgment seat of Christ is mentioned in the scripture for those who are believers. We know we're saved. We know we're going to heaven. That we must appear before him and that which we've done in the flesh, whether it be good or bad, it says that it's classified as either wood, hay, and stubble or gold, silver, or precious stones. In other words, the issue is not that we're saved or not, because we know we are. It's what have we done with or how have we lived this faith the Lord has given us. Now, if we were to dissect this, and we're going to do it briefly this morning because we could spend weeks on each and every one of these, that five places in your New Testament, it talks about a certain crown. Oftentimes, we call these the rewards, the, the opportunity that we have to one day stand before our Savior and say that we lived a life of faith, that we sacrificed the things of the flesh for the things of the Spirit. And this is one of the five. You know, this is important because in the second chapter of the first letter of Paul that's given to us chronologically, he says, hey, there is a reward. There is an opportunity to receive a crown of rejoicing. Now, hopefully those of you were able to download or access the outline. I've listed all five of these uh, for you. But we often call this the crown of evangelism. 
He says that what is our crown of rejoicing? That you will be with us, that you are there at the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's saying is that those who we've led to the Lord, those who we've shared the gospel with and who have responded, much like Jesus said in John chapter 4, uh, that those have sowed and those have reaped will rejoice together. And those of you who have walked through either at the local church level or even the seminary level that may be watching my evangelism courses, one of the things that I teach is it takes, in our culture today, over 20 gospel presentations on average uh, for someone to become a believer in Jesus Christ. That's just the culture we live in today. Maybe you're a person number three, maybe you're a person number 22. Uh, but if you share, and at some point they become a believer, he says here there's a crown of rejoicing that we are rewarded, that the Lord celebrates in our lives when we share the gospel with other individuals. So in the midst of their suffering, he says, hey, there is coming a time where the Lord will crown you. He will, uh, shall we say, celebrate you for making the decision of taking the opportunity to live for him and to share his message with other people. Now, there are four other ones that I want to briefly walk through this morning, but then I want to get to the purpose of it. These are the opportunities. As you go to work this morning, whether you're going into the office deemed as an essential place of work, or whether you're working from home, whether you're doing school today in a, in a virtual environment, or whether you're in a completely different walk than you ever thought you would be in, this is your opportunity. When you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody, when you share that hope, you share that joy, it says one day when they're with you in heaven, there is a crown of rejoicing. I'll unpack all that crown stuff in just a moment. The second one we see in scripture, and by the way, I'm just going to kind of walk through them in a, in a certain order here, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 24, going through verse 27, uh, it talks about that uh, we run a race in this Christian life, that not one to get a mortal or a crown that will fade away, but one that is everlasting. Again, you see this idea of a crown uh, being celebrated, uh, shall we say, being rewarded for a lack of better terms. And if you look at that passage there, now remember, this is the church at Corinth that were struggling with their carnality. They were struggling uh, with the temptations of the flesh and, and doing things that, according to the Apostle Paul, not even the Gentiles thought of. What does it say there? One of the things that they did is they kept their body into subjection. And the idea is that this incorruptible crown is for those who live a sanctified life. They choose righteousness over sin. Uh, they choose to do the things of God rather than the things of the world. And so one of the things that we're seeing here with these opportunities is I think sometimes when we make the right decision, I think when we don't go or don't do or don't say what the flesh is tempting us to do, you know, oftentimes it brings suffering just like it did to these early believers. A lot of times it brings opposition. A lot of times we think, is it really worth it to live for Jesus? I mean, after all, the the, the greater majority of people are not, and they seem to be succeeding is for an earthly perspective. And, and we seem sometimes to feel as outcast or we're the opposition, or maybe we're the strange ones, the weird ones, you know, we're the third wheel, so to speak. But this one talks about this crown of sanctification that when we live a life that rejects the temptations of this world and we're faithful to the things of God, it says we will receive an incorruptible crown, one that does not fade away. The third quote crown or reward that we see uh, is found in the book of James chapter 1 verse 12. There it talks about receiving a crown of life for those that suffer. And not just the suffering that we see here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 of the opposition of the faith. But it talks about talking about the temptations of life. Now, if I were to kind of dissect things, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is talking about living a sanctified, righteous life, doing the things of God even when it's inconvenient. James chapter 1 verse 12 is really speaking strategically about temptation. When we have the opportunity to, to be a part of or to do something that's completely contrary to the things of God that maybe nobody but God himself would know or find out about. It says there is a crown of life. Fourthly, the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Remember the Apostle Paul, this is the very last chapter of his life. He's talking about that he's run his race, he has not faltered. And he says there is a crown of righteousness that is laid up before him at the coming of Jesus Christ. We oftentimes call this what we call the second coming crown. Those who love his appearing. Those who are more excited about Jesus coming back for them than they are uh, existing and living through uh, this earthly world. Now, I know many of you uh, on the other side of the camera have known me for many years, and I'm sure some of you at some point have heard uh, either in brief or in length the story that I'm about to share. But I find it interesting uh, that the story I'm about to tell you took place over 20 years ago, it took place on the other side of 
the global pandemic took place on the other side of 9-11, took place on the other side of the, the global recession of, of 2007 and 8 and such. It was in the late 90s. I found myself in an environment where I was doing a Bible conference slash revival small little community out in West Texas. And it was one of those places where every night before the service, they would gather the pastor and myself and, and somebody would feed us in their home. And it was a, a great time of fellowship and great food. And I remember that I announced that that night at the service, I was going to be preaching about the second coming of Christ. One of my favorite subject matters in all of the Bible, not only because it's so prolific, but it's so promising that one day, as Galatians 1.4 says, he will deliver us from this present evil world. That being said, uh, the lady who was the very gracious host that night in her home, she just asked me, she said, are you still going to talk about the second coming time? I said, well, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, well, I, I've appreciated you being in my home, but I want you to know I'm not, I'm not going to be there. I thought I was a little perplexed. I mean, why not? I mean, you've hosted us and I can understand that there's been a lot of difficulty in doing this, but why not? And then she began to explain. She said, and I, I couldn't believe it. She said, well, I don't really want to hear about it because I kind of like this old world and I kind of like it the way it is. I don't want it to change. You know, I wonder today if that individual would say the same thing. On this side of 9-11, would you really say that? On this side of the global pandemic, when we see what's going on in our world today, do we really want to be, quote, lovers of this world? Do we really want to be advocates of this world? I don't know about you. But if Jesus came back right now, I wouldn't be upset at all. Come, Lord Jesus, get me out of this mess. You know, there's coming a time where the Bible says that the dead in Christ and the alive in Christ will be taken out of here. He says, the Apostle Paul says, there is a crown. There's a crown of righteousness for those of us who love his appearing. And so, in other words, our perspective of life is, even though we work hard in life, even though uh, we desire to be the best of, of whatever our hands are, are, are put to, like Colossians 3.23 says, that more than anything, there is a crown, there is a reward for those of us who just want Jesus to come back. And last but not least, there is the crown of glory. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 5. We call this oftentimes the crown of ministry. It says uh, that we as a shepherd who uh, look over the flock, there's a crown for us who are faithful therein. I think erroneously this has oftentimes been called the pastor's crown. How about all those in ministry or the minister's crown? No, this is for anybody who has the privilege of shepherding anybody in the faith. That could be your own uh, home, your children, your co-workers. If you're an educator, it could be the people in your classroom, the people who work in the cubicle next to you in the old days, or those who, shall we say, are on a Zoom conference with you in one of the boxes next to you. That um, I, I think what's critical about that is if there are other believers in our life that we have the opportunity to encourage, and even at times uh, do what Second Timothy chapter 3 says, even to bring rebuke through God's Word, that there is a, a crown laid up for us. There is a reward for shepherding other believers. I think it's interesting. The first crown I addressed talked about leading people to Christ, and the last one was walking people in the relationship with Christ. Now, here's where I want to kind of close the Bible study. And then uh, as soon as the Bible study is off, don't, don't tune out yet, because I do have an announcement that some of you are aware of, but others are not, that I think is very exciting uh, in the days ahead. All of this kind of climaxes in Revelation chapter 4. And so I want to close out by going to the last book of the Bible. It, it makes perfect sense this morning uh, as we talk about the second coming, as we talk about the crown of righteousness uh, to end in kind of that final book of the Bible. Chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, it says, The 24 elders, they fall down before him that, that sat on the throne. They worship him that liveth forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure are they and were they Create it. Now, today we have talked about that we have an incredible opportunity as we go forward in our relationship with Jesus Christ, that when we share our faith with others, when we uh, choose to, to live a sanctified life, when we reject temptation, when we'd rather Jesus come today than us to live another day. And, and as we go through these things, as we encourage other believers, there is an opportunity to one day be rewarded, to stand before that famous judgment seat of Christ and for it not to be wood, hay, and stubble, but to be gold, silver, and precious jewels. But I think one of the great errors is, ah, oh, I can have five crowns as I walk the, the streets of gold. No. See, the opportunity that lies before us isn't to one day walk the streets of gold with a bunch of crowns on our head. It's what Revelation 4 says, that as they gathered around what we know as the throne, it says, he who sat on it, that's Jesus Christ. 
They cast their crowns before it. See, the motive or the purpose of this reward is not so that we can collect crowns. It's so that we can give them back to Jesus. You know, all throughout Scripture, it talks about being a cheerful giver. It's more blessed to give uh, than it is to receive. And that that's in this case as well. And so you and I today have an incredible opportunity that we can see what we're walking through as an obstacle or we can see it as an opportunity. We can see it as something that would hinder our faith and belief or something that would, shall we say, encourage or actually enhance our belief. And it's all based on where our eyes are going to be. Are our eyes going to be on the newscast, the circumstances, and the situation? Or are our eyes going to be on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith? Ladies and gentlemen, you have an incredible opportunity today to be the salt and the light that the world is craving, to go out into the darkness of a global pandemic, and to be a different, distinct voice. I know that the enemy wants to wear you out. I know that you, like I, we're getting exhausted of this new normal. It's tiring. It's There's nothing fun about this. It is a struggle. But don't let it be an obstacle. Let it be an opportunity. May we be at the end of the day. May we be on the other side of this. May we be stronger. May we be, uh, shall we say, uh, those of gold, silver, and precious stones rather than wood, hay, and stubble. Now, that kind of draws us to a close of the formal Bible study. We have a few moments left as far as the clock is concerned. And so I want to share with all of you some exciting news that you may or may not be aware of. We began to announce this uh, yesterday, that what we know as Easter Sunday is right around the corner. Um, we like to joke that this is Super Bowl Sunday or the Daytona 500 Sunday uh, around churches in our community and even uh, the entire globe. This is the one day that determines all other days because the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is the very reason that you got up this morning and you are watching and participating in this Bible study. 1 Corinthians 15 says, if Jesus Christ was not risen from the dead, then everything of life of faith is in vain. Well, guess what? You and I are still going to be in a world of social distancing. We're still going to be in a world of what you and I call virtual worship services. And so we have come uh, to somewhat of a decision that we're going to offer on Easter Sunday an opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a social distancing manner, but in a very different manner. Now, one of the things we want to invite you to do if you're in the East Alabama area, or many of you may want to drive a long distance, that's fine with us, is we want you to come and gather on our campus in your cars in the parking lot, and we're going to have a live worship service. Now, it's going to be myself and select individuals. We're actually going to be standing on the roof of what we call the 316 Center while you're parked in your car, and we're going to be broadcasting live over 97.7 FM, the kicker here in the Auburn Opelika area. And you're going to have the opportunity to actually see with your eyes that which you have been hearing and watching by live stream for, for a variety of weeks now. Now, we're going to have three worship opportunities. At 7 a.m., um, it's going to be a traditional service. We're going to be singing the traditional hymns of our faith and hearing from the Word of God. At 9 a.m., it's going to be a contemporary service. And at 11 a.m., it's going to be a traditional service. Now, I understand these are different times than even you and I are used to. And the reason that they're being so spaced apart is because of the traffic flow of getting all the cars in at one time and then all the cars out at the same time. And so we didn't want to be rushed. We didn't want to have people waiting around the corner at the intersections to get into the next service. And so we've placed an hour between them. Now, I want to thank two distinct entities this morning for this opportunity. Number one, 97.7 FM here in our community, who is willing to broadcast all three of these Easter services on 100,000 watts of FM station. Uh, those in the local area, uh, there's an incredible area that will hear this. So you don't actually have to be on the property uh, to be a part of it, but you have to be on the property to actually see uh, what is happening. And I want to also thank Jeff Coat Tramp Funeral Home, who's in our community. They actually uh, have purchased what we call the gospel train in our community from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, it is primarily kind of a southern gospel celebration of our faith. And they were willing to rearrange their um, already schedule that they have uh, to accommodate us. And so kind of we're gathering together that day at 7, 9, and 11 a.m. to celebrate the resurrection in a very uh, hopefully exciting social distance manner now. For those of you who live in other states or for those of you who say, you know, I'm just not comfortable even getting out in a parking lot full of cars, 
Uh, let me remind you, nobody's getting out of their cars. We're going to stay just like we were driving down the highway together, except we'll be parked. Uh, but we're still going to be broadcasting live, Facebook Live, social media, OPS here in our local community, our website, fbcopelaka.com. Just instead of me being in an empty room, um, I'm going to be on the rooftop and hopefully have a parking lot full of cars uh, we're about 12 days away from what we know as Resurrection Sunday. And I just want to encourage you, if you're in our community, be a part of this. Come together. Uh, we're able to watch by way of our phones and our TVs. We're able to hear by way of this means in the radio. Uh, but what a wonderful time to gather together and see that we're not the only ones um, who, who are people of faith. In our, we're not the only ones uh, who are excited about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think Easter Sunday has an incredible uh, opportunity in our lives as we begin to pull cars in the parking lot to see we're not walking through this alone. And we'll get to see with our own eyes uh, that which we've been watching on television, that which we've been uh, listening to on the radio. So Easter Sunday, April the 12th, 7 o'clock traditional, 9 o'clock contemporary, 11 o'clock traditional, from the comfort of your car on 97.7 FM. I'm going to be on the 316 Center. Uh, I have a funny feeling at 11 o'clock it's going to get a little toasty up there, but to be able to see you in the parking lot is absolutely worth it. No matter whether you live in our local community or far away, thank you again for being a part of our weekly men's Bible study. Next week, we roll into chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. Feel free to read ahead. Look forward to seeing you then. Good day. God bless.